Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Romans chapter 14. Romans chapter 14. This is our fourth lesson in Romans 14. We did go through verse by verse and did the expository style teaching, and now I'm taking some time to do some topicals. We've talked about dietary laws. We talked about the Sabbath. Today we're going to talk about something that for some of you will be review. For others of you, it might be a little shocking. I'm just going to tell you at the front end, when you are born again, you cannot lose your salvation. You cannot forfeit your salvation. It is not contingent upon you. I was raised, Bill and I were raised in a church where we were taught that if you are born again and you get yourself mixed, mixed up in sin, you go do the wrong thing, watch the monkeys TV show on Monday night. If you've been around here, you know what I'm talking about. That you would be forfeiting your salvation and you had to get saved again. And so every Sunday, I'm going to the altar. I'm, I'm trying to get saved again and again and again, always worrying. I was on my knees on, I remember Heavenly Midnight one night, Bill. That I was in the chapel, and it was, it was late at night, and I was praying, God, please, please come today. Save us. Let the rapture happen today, because I knew that by tomorrow, I was going to sin and mess it up. And so I just wanted the Lord to come. But I want you to know that over the years of studying the scriptures, I have come to realize that you are secure in Christ, and it's not because of you. It's because of him. And we're going to focus on that today. Amen? Amen. Man, you can see there is a little bit of Pentecostal in here. I could tell. You just, they're just getting warmed up. All right. Let's read together. Romans 14. I'm going to read the first eight verses today. Receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to disputes over doubtful things. For one believes he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats only vegetables. Let not him who eats despise him who does not eat. And let not him who does not eat judge him who eats, for God has received him. Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. One person esteems one day above another, another esteems every day alike. Let each be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it to the Lord, and he who does not observe the day to the Lord, he does not observe it. He who eats, eats to the Lord, for he gives God thanks, and he who does not eat to the Lord, he does not eat and gives God thanks. For none of us live unto himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, underline this, we are the Lord's. We are the Lord's. We belong to him. And Father, we do thank you for this opportunity today. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege that you have given us to gather in this building today to celebrate around your throne, worshiping you, praying together, fellowshipping with one another, and studying the Bible so that we might know how to give an answer to everyone that asks of us for the hope that lies within us with meekness and fear. Thank you, Lord, for those that are listening live on the radio today. Thank you for those that are listening on the stream. Thank you for those that will be listening later in the archives. And Lord, thank you so much for those that are here in this building and all the different rooms and activities that are taking place. Lord, be glorified in this place, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So a couple verses I want to have you note right away. First of all, it's verse 4. And if you have your Bibles, I do want you to mark your Bibles in this context so you can come back to this. If not, and you're taking notes, or at least mentally note this, so that you can mark your Bibles later. Verse 4 says, Who are you to judge another's servant? To his own master he stands or falls. Now in this context, he's talking about matters of conscience. Whether it's okay to have bacon on your hamburger or whether you can worship on a Saturday or you can have a glass of wine or no glass of wine. We're not to judge one another in these matters of conscience, disputable things as Paul talks about it. There are things, of course, that we would address and there is a protocol for how we address those things that the Bible directly forbids. Adultery, fornication, licentiousness, etc. We'll come back to that. 
But in this context, he's telling us that we are not to be going around as fruit inspectors in trying to police everyone for their behaviors. God is able to do that. Look at the second part of this verse. To his own master, he stands or falls. Indeed, he will be made to stand, for God is able to make him stand. Now there's two things there that I want you to understand. The first one is this. He will be made to stand. Underscore that in your mind, in your Bible. We have plenty of places in the Bible that tell us the second part, God is able to make him stand. Now, we already know God is able. There's nothing too hard for the Lord. But this is interesting now. We have a new statement that's an introduction into a doctrinal perspective in the New Testament, or shall we say in this context, in the church age. God will make him stand. Not just God is able to make him stand, but God will make him stand. Then we go to verse seven and eight. For none of us lives to himself, and no one dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We are his, we've been bought with a price. We're gonna talk about that. First of all, let me mention to you that Paul the Apostle, formerly known as Saul, was a Jew, he was a zealot, he was of the tribe of Benjamin, he was, according to his own words in the book of Philippians, found blameless in the law. After the resurrection and ascension of Christ, he was persecuting the church. And so he lived in what you see here as the brown half circle. This is the old covenant dispensation. It's from the time of Abraham until Christ. He lived during that period of time. He was a believer in the law. He was a believer in the prophets. He was a believer in the ordinances, the, the fashions, the traditions, the standards of the Jewish faith. And he lived through the transition into the church age, the blue half circle. This is post-resurrection, post-ascension. The day of Pentecost becomes our bookmark. And then the, the latter bookmark is the rapture of the church. And so we are living in the church age. During the early first century, Saul, we know him as Paul, but Saul was persecuting the church. Jesus identified himself with the church and said, why are you persecuting me? Not just them, but me. Paul uh, saw that Jesus identified himself directly with his church. And Saul was persecuting the Lord. Now, this is the part that is interesting and is very important that you should understand it. When we are dealing with dispensational theology, you have to understand that the administration of the old covenant dispensation, the, the, the methodology by which men were guarded and guided and instructed by the Lord was very different than it is in the church age. So during that period of time, we're looking at a graphic, the brown half circle, in that period of time, we were required to follow the Lord and we were required to cling to the Lord. We were required to continue in the faith, even in as much as in the Gospels. Remember, this is a historical document documenting the life and times of Jesus in his first incarnational earthly ministry before the cross, the death, burial, and resurrection. So this effectively, the Gospels are part of the Old Testament. They, the, the, the marker in your Bible should be moved. It shouldn't be in front of the book of Matthew. It should effectively be in front of the book of Acts. So tear it out and put it, I'm <laughs> just, just kidding. Jesus said things like this, abide in me, for if you do not abide in me, you will be cast forth as a branch that is withered and thrown into the fire. And Christians read this and say, well, there's, he's talking to me, and therefore I have to abide in the Lord. But I want you to understand that since the resurrection of Christ and the infilling of the Holy Spirit, it is no longer you abiding in him, it is he abiding in you. Everything has changed. The Lord has purchased you with his own blood. You are not your own. He began a work in you and he will be faithful to complete it. We're gonna look at a few scriptures concerning that today. 
Now, I want to start with what Paul addresses, what Peter addresses, and then what is looked at carefully in the epistle, the short little one chapter epistle, Jude. Now, because of time, I'll just have it on the screen for you. You don't have to flip over there. Let me give you the context. Like Paul the Apostle, like Saul prior to his regeneration, the apostate is a person that was living in the Old Covenant dispensation and failed to move through the dispensation into the church age and trust Jesus as Messiah. Many people today ask the question, well, what is an apostate? And we often hear pastors and teachers say that apostates are Christians that have abandoned their faith. That is not a biblical concept. That is not a biblical position. An apostate is one who has abandoned the faith, but it is in the context, the person that was in the old covenant dispensation like Saul, that did not follow through in the fruition, coming to fruition of those promises that were in the law and the prophets that were manifest in Jesus. And so they came to a certain point and when they found Christ, they saw Christ, they rejected Christ as Messiah. John addresses this in his first epistle. Who is an antichrist but he that denies that Jesus is the Christ? And so in this context, an apostate is a person referenced in the book of Jude and other passages of scripture that were people in the faith. And there is only one faith. It is the faith of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. It is the faith of David. It is the faith of Moses looking forward to the coming to fruition of Jesus the Messiah who would come as the Lamb of God and take away the sins of the world. But they stopped short. They did not enter his rest. We talked about that last week. The Sabbath. Who is the Sabbath? Jesus is our Sabbath. That is why Paul said one man esteems one day above another. Another man esteems another day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. If the Sabbath was just about a day, Paul couldn't say that. But we enter into his rest by faith alone in Christ alone. And so in this context, the apostate is a person who was in the faith in the old covenant dispensation and stopped short of entering into his rest. That was a person that did not transition from the administration of the old covenant and move into the administration of the church age. The big change is this. For example, illustrated in the life of David after his sin with Bathsheba, he prayed, create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from your presence, take not your Holy Spirit from me. You can't pray that today. We shouldn't even sing that today because he will never leave you nor forsake you. He has sealed you with the Holy Spirit of promise as a guarantee. We're gonna look at a couple of verses today concerning those very things. And so David could pray in the old covenant, take not your Holy Spirit from me. Do not forsake me. You can't because he will never leave you and never forsake you. That is a key element in the dispensational change from the old covenant to the new covenant. Now Jude mentions this in relationship to the apostates. This is first century, this is a first century letter. And he's talking about those that have abandoned their faith. Their faith was the faith that they embraced under the old covenant and by virtue of not entering in, they failed as illustrated by Jude when he said, God having saved the children of Israel out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who believed not because they did not have the security of the faith as we do today. They had security as believers if they continued in the faith. We have security as believers today because the faith lives in us. He has gifted us with faith. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works with God as before ordained that we should walk in them. 
And so addressing the early church, talking about the apostates, Jude says these words. Uh, they'll put these on the screen for you. Now unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. The language he uses would be understood by the Jews. He is able to keep you. But Paul takes it further here in this text and he says, verse four, look at it again, look at your Bible, verse four, B. To his own master he stands or falls, indeed he will be made to stand. He will be made to stand. This is new language. This is unusual to the church age. Now God gave promises to Israel. I will make you stand. I will make you stand before your enemies. I will give you victory. But in this context, it's salvific. God is the one who saves us and he will keep us. It's incredible. Now let's go to Philippians chapter one. Take your, the time to flip over there with this passage. A couple of verses I wanna bring to you. Philippians chapter one. I'm listening for pages. I'll give you a second. You have applications, you have tablets, you have the screen. But we want you to see this. This is chapter one, verse six. Philippians chapter one, verse six. Being confident of this very thing, that he who began or has begun a good work in you will complete it. You cannot thwart the plan of God. He who begun a, has begun a good work in you, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The day refers to the second coming. The day refers to the time of judgment. The day refers to Christ reigning on the earth. It's an all-inclusive expression. The Lord will keep you. You're going to go through the, the temporal trials of this life, but he will make you stand. He will not lose his own. All that the Father gives me will come to me and I will lose none of them, Jesus said. Now flip the page over to chapter two, verse 13. Chapter two, verse 13. This is an incredible verse. You should underline it in your Bible. Memorize it, tattoo it to your forehead. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Sometimes we come to the Lord for our good pleasure. Well, I don't want to go to hell. I'm going to respond to the gospel. But this is God's work. He's the one that chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. This was God's plan. This is God's purpose. And he who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He is able to make you stand. He will make you stand for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for whose good pleasure his his good pleasure essential that we should know this now how were we purchased well we're purchased by the blood of Jesus let's go to first Peter chapter 1 first Peter chapter 1 if you would take the time flip over there I want you to be able to mark these verses 1 Peter chapter 1, starting in verse 18, says this, knowing, that means it's something we should know, <laughs> knowing that you were not redeemed, redeemed means to be purchased, so we were slaves to sin, slaves to the devil, slaves to the death, slaves to our flesh, and the Lord purchased us out of slavery. Now we are his bond servants. We are armored up in the things of the Lord. And because we know that we were redeemed, not with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers. By the way, how many of you know that when Peter wrote, he was not writing to Gentiles, he was writing to Jews. And so he's telling the Jews that they were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold or even in the context of the law, aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. Now here's the elements of time and eternity. 
Indeed, he was foreordained. Remember we talked about predestination and foreordination, pro orizo in the Greek, to be marked off in advance. In this context, God has foreordained before the foundations of the world. So before time began that Christ would redeem his own, this was not an afterthought, not a plan B. God wasn't surprised when man screwed up. And so in this context, it was foreordained from before the foundations of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. So we know that outside of time, God planned for our redemption inside of time. And inside of time, as we responded to the gospel, we became those persons foreknown by God from before the foundations of the world. And through him we believe, verse 21, in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Now keep in mind, it's for his glory. It is his work. He who has begun a good work in you will be faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And now by the precious blood as of a lamb shed for us, he purchased us with his own blood. I wanna ask you a question. If God purchases you, with his own blood, the blood of his only begotten son, is he going to forfeit you? Is he going to lose you? Is he gonna lose track of you? Is he gonna stop dealing with you? Is he gonna stop working in you? Absolutely not. You are priceless to him. It was through the blood of his only begotten son, and it is not because of you. You are not priceless, and therefore he saved you. You became priceless because he saved you through the precious blood of Jesus. It's incredible. Now, that takes us back to our text in Romans chapter 14. So just for a moment, go there and underscore these verses because it's so important that we recognize these and take them to memory. None of us live to himself and no one dies to himself. Why? Because you belong to the Lord. For if we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. We're not our own. We've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus, amen? Now, go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, I know I'm making you work today, you guys. I'm perspiring already, and it must be you're by proxy or something. I don't know what's happening there. But 2 Corinthians, I wanna take you to chapter one. Couple of verses here to close today. Paul writing to the Corinthians, these are Gentiles, they have been redeemed. And he says here concerning the Lord, verse 20, all the promises of God in him, that is in Christ, are yes and in him a man to the glory of God through us. And so now God is glorifying himself through us. He is glorifying himself in us. And it is because of his work in us, the work that he began, he will be faithful to complete. It is God who is at work in you, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And all these promises, the, the precious promises that he made, for example, I will give them eternal life and they shall never perish. Is that a promise? I believe it. And all the promises of God in him are yes and amen. What does that mean? It means they're absolute. This is not wishy-washy. They are yes and amen. All the promises in him are yes and amen. Now he who establishes us, the word that we use here for establish corresponds directly with he will be made to stand. He establishes you. He establishes your footprints. He establishes your heart. He orders everything in your life. He is at work in you for his glory. And he establishes you in Christ and has anointed us. The one who has anointed us is God, who has also sealed us and given us the spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. That's unusual. In the old covenant dispensation, the spirit of God could come upon you and leave. That's what happened to Saul. Remember the, the spirit of God departed from Saul and an unclean spirit from the Lord went to torment him? Today, he will never leave you nor forsake you. The spirit fills you and moreover, he seals you. Now sealing has to do with, for example, the transmission of a letter. We'll use that as an illustration. 
I'm the sender. I have a letter. I know what the contents include. I take the letter, I fold it up, I drop some wax on it, I have a signet ring, I press my ring into the, the melted wax, it hardens up and that is a sealed envelope. Now we know that the contents are untampered with. Your contents cannot be tampered with. These are the seals of God upon you. And then the letter is delivered and the one at the receiving end gets the letter and he sees the seal and he realizes that things have come in full context and intact. You have been sealed for safe delivery. You've been sealed for safe keeping. The, one is the, the Lord is the one that is written in our hearts by his Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament times, in the Old dispensation he wrote in tablets of stone but they have been annulled in Christ they are obsolete the Bible makes that clear Ephesians Colossians Hebrews but now he is written in our hearts by the Holy Spirit and he has sealed us with the Holy Spirit of promise and he is the guarantee of our safe delivery it's incredible you guys incredible let's go to Ephesians chapter 1 Ephesians chapter 1 and we're just going to read a couple of verses there, and then I'll let you go to the fair. How's that? There's hot dogs and hamburgers. Doritos. And Doritos. Nacho, your average pastor. What, what was it? That, what did it say? Nacho average pastor. I got a bag of Dorito chips delivered to me, and it said nacho average pastor. And I thought, hey. <laughs> Thank you for the chips, by the way. <laughs> Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth. So you have been introduced to Christ. You know Christ. You've transitioned from those old now promises that were kept under the old covenant that were the type and the shadow of things to come but the substances of Christ you've trusted Christ in him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth the gospel of your salvation in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise who is the guarantee of our inheritance so even the context of you you're going to lose your inheritance if you don't be late, behave no the Bible doesn't teach that there are contexts in which there is a Jewish world that will be given certain prerogatives and privileges during the millennial kingdom, but your inheritance is in Christ. And in this context, I want you to see this, guarantees our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. It's not about you. It's God at work in you. It's not your work in God. We have to get that straight. We're always talking about, well, I'm working for the kingdom. I'm serving so that I can enhance the kingdom, advance the kingdom. No, you're not. God is the one in charge of his kingdom. He is the king of his own kingdom. He is the one that is at work in you, not you at work in him. Keep that straight. Now go to chapter four as our final verse for today. Chapter four, Verse 30, one verse. I told you I would come back to the idea of licentiousness. Here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter four, verse 30, to the Ephesians. This was a circular letter that was given to everybody. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Let's stop there for a minute. Now you guys have heard me talk about blessed misery. If you are born again and you get out of whack, you start doing things that you should not be doing, the Holy Spirit is grieved within you. Now, look, you're not a disappointment to God. He already knows. You can't surprise him so he can't be disappointed. You don't have to wear guilt. I don't want anyone wearing guilt. All your guilt and shame is taken away at the cross. But there is a sense in which a believer can grieve the Holy Spirit because he wants what is best for you. And so the doctrine of eternal security is often a, a doctrine that pastors will avoid because they think if we tell the believer, once you're saved, you're born again, you can't lose your salvation, you can't forfeit your salvation, that you're telling everyone, go live like the devil, it doesn't matter. I will tell you, you will be miserable. You won't lose your salvation, but you will be miserable, and it'll hurt others around you. We, we will never want to live unrighteously in the present age, but you don't have to be afraid. 
I don't have to get on my knees in the chapel on th January 31st and say, oh God, please come today because I know by tomorrow I'm gonna mess all this up. You cannot thwart his plan. He will fulfill all of his good pleasure, saith the Lord. It's his work in you, not your work in him chosen in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love without blame there is no impending judgment where you're going to stand before the lord and god's going to review your life and show you all of your mistakes no we're going to start talking about that next sunday you have been redeemed by the blood of the lamb and you have been made precious in his sight you are perfect you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You are perfected in him. This is his work. You are his workmanship. Paul tells the Ephesians, you are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. The word workmanship there is poema. It's where we get our word poem. You are the poem he's writing. I talk about romancing the, the, the glory of the gospel. It's amazing. But don't grieve the Holy Spirit. That's the blessed misery. When you're living in sin, you feel uncomfortable. That's the blessed misery. When you feel this sense of like, oh, I can't do this anymore. That's the blessed misery. And why do I call it blessed misery? Because it is a blessing that the Holy Spirit that has sealed you, that dwells in you, that will never leave you, never forsake you, dwells in you. And the grief that he feels for you is manifest in you. And you're saying, oh, this is a sign that I'm born again. I can actually note this because when I feel miserable in my sins, it is pointing out the fact that God is at work in me, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. But do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. You were sealed for the day of redemption. I don't know about you, but that makes me happy because I can mess up things quick. I do all the time. But I will tell you, never, never, never is God going to say, well, you used to be my son, but not anymore. He's never going to say to me, well, Paul, you've gone too far. I can't shape you. I can't mold you. I can't make you anymore. God is the molder. He is the maker. He is the one that has called us unto himself. He is the redeemer. He has redeemed us by his own blood. And if you're here today, if you're listening on the radio, you're listening online, I don't care where you are, I want you to know you don't have to clean up your act to come to the Lord. You don't have to repent of your sins to come to the Lord. That's front-loading the gospel, you guys. If you come to the Lord and you have to repent of all your sins, that means you have to clean up your act before he will accept you. No, he accepts you just like you are, wretched, miserable, poor and blind and naked, and he says, come unto me, drink of the water of life that I give. I will sup with you, you with me. And if you're listening today and you don't know these wonderful truths, you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid of the vaccine mandate. You don't have to be afraid of the political climate that's going to hell in a handbasket. You don't have to be afraid of who the next president will be or who the president is supposed to be now. You can know for sure that you have a king, a king of glory. Who is the king of glory? Lord Almighty. Amen? We need to preach this gospel. We need to help others to have hope, to have peace in the midst of a fearful time. And so let's do that. And if you don't know the Lord today, this is just God calling you. If you're even going, yep, that's me, that's me, then I want you to know that God already knew you from before the foundations of the world. He's just entering time for you with a message of hope. How shall they hear without a preacher? There you go. Now go away and have fun at the fair. But let's stand before we go. Father, thank you for this time. Send us forth today in your grace and peace and truth and the anointing of your spirit. Let us be friends to those around us. And Lord, just for a moment, I, I want to interrupt this minute to say, Lord, that you would touch every person from environment control that has come here from all over this country for this conference this week. Every person, every owner, every assistant, every spouse, every child, that they will hear the gospel, that they will love hearing the gospel, that they will know you, and that they will go forth, not just as business owners, but as ministers, as missionaries into this world. 
Thank you, Lord, for the privilege you have given all of us to go forth from this place into our mission field. Send us forth today, we pray, in grace and peace, in Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys.